What is the maximum temperature drop you have ever heard reported during an eclipse? Dr. Telepin back with another video for my Solar Eclipse Timer users regarding eclipse temperature drops. In 2019, I recorded an incredible temperature drop. Let's talk about how and why. Fifteen minutes until second contact, observe changes in ambient temperature. It's fun to feel the temperature drop during an eclipse. It is physical evidence that the sun's radiant energy is getting blocked even though you are not yet noticing dimming light. It's a nice experiment for students to do with just a regular thermometer. It keeps them occupied during the first partial phases. Make a graph with the temperature on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. Try to find a thermometer marked with single-digit temperature increments and take measurements every five minutes. Mark the actual contact times on your time scale. Plot the readings and you should end up with something that looks like this. Two things to look for are the total temperature drop and does the recovery of temperature lag behind the actual C3 time. You can also become more sophisticated and use some type of digital thermometer with data logging. And in my case, in 2002 and 2019, I used a programmable temperature data logger called the Thermocron I button. I tried to do temperature logging in 2017, but I messed it up by using a data logger with too much thermal mass that did not react quickly enough. If you want to monitor the change in temperature during an eclipse, there are a few points about data collection you should follow to try to make your readings as accurate as possible. Here they are. Suspend the collecting device above the ground about chest high. Block direct sunlight from hitting the device by having tin foil on the sun side to keep the device in shade. In summer conditions, when the ground below the device may have time to heat up, put a tin foil blocker below the device also to prevent radiant energy from traveling upward from the ground. The sides that are not blocked from the sun must be open to allow air circulation. You are trying to measure the actual local air temperature and not trapped warmer air. Use a device with a low thermal mass so it reacts quickly to changes in temperature. Big devices retain their own heat so they do not respond to the changes in air temperature rapidly. So data loggers should be based on a probe system. Log the temperature every two to five minutes over the hour and a half it usually takes between first contact and second contact. And if you are patient enough to stick around after totality, get data from C3 to C4. With data loggers, you can download the data and create a nice graph from a spreadsheet. Now I want to talk about using the Thermocron I button for eclipse temperature data logging. I was introduced to this device after I went to my first eclipse in 2001 by one of my friends at NASA, Mitzi Adams, who is a solar scientist. I saw her temperature data log using an I button from the 2001 eclipse, where she obtained data from downtown Lusaka, Zambia, and recorded about an 11 degree Fahrenheit drop in temperature. She was nice enough to let me borrow her I button for my next eclipse. In Zimbabwe, Africa, on December 4, 2002, it was a summertime eclipse in the southern hemisphere. It occurred during the mid to late morning. I used the Thermocron I button for this eclipse. I had it suspended between the legs of a tripod and covered it from direct sunlight with a white towel, keeping it open to the back. I recorded an 8.1 degree Fahrenheit drop in temperature. Let's talk more about the benefits of using an I button for eclipse temperature logging. First, it is small. It has a low thermal mass, so it can react quickly to temperature changes. The internal thermometer can measure 0.5 degrees centigrade increments, and within the range of normal outdoor temperatures, it is very accurate. The snap-on clip makes it easy to hang, allowing good air circulation. Using its docking receptor attached to a computer and using a software interface, it is programmed in advance to start logging data. 
This is called starting a mission, so you do not have to worry about it during the eclipse. It's set and forget. After the eclipse, you hook it up to the computer again and stop the mission. Then you download the data and create a graph in a spreadsheet. The iButton is manufactured by a company called Maxim Integrated, and they have an iButton starter kit that has everything you need to use one. The software is called One Wire Viewer, and it is a free download from Maxim. In 2019, I bought my starter kit from Mauser Electronics. I will do another video that shows the details of working with an iButton and programming a mission with the software. For the eclipse in Argentina, South America, on July 2, 2019, I bought a new iButton and set things up correctly for good data. I suspended the iButton between tripod legs, protecting it from the sun with tinfoil, but kept it open to the back. This late afternoon eclipse would not have much of a component of upward ground radiation, so I did not block the bottom with tinfoil. I am glad I did the setup well because I had no idea how dramatic the temperature drop would be during this eclipse due to the perfect set of conditions. The reason for the maximum drop was this was a winter eclipse, so the path of the sun in the sky, the ecliptic, was low to begin with. And it was a late afternoon eclipse with the sun setting by fourth contact. So the air at ground level was already cooling leading up to first contact. The conditions were clear with almost no humidity, and the site was a dry open dirt field with minimal breeze. It was just perfect for the lower solar energy delivered to the ground to result in a rapid response of decreasing air temperatures just above the ground. At the point of first contact, the temperature was 67.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Right at second contact, the temperature was 42.8 degrees, which is a 24.3 degree decrease in temperature. But through totality, which lasted 2 minutes and 30 seconds, the temperature continued to fall. So by third contact, the temperature was 41.9 degrees, a 25.2 degree drop during the partial phases. In fact, the lowest temperature recorded was 41 degrees, and this occurred just after third contact and lasted for three minutes before starting to climb again. This delay is due to the fact that the air temperature is driven by the return of radiant energy being absorbed by the ground, causing ground warming and subsequently changing the air temperature. So the temperature response is not immediate. So the total decrease in temperature I documented for this eclipse was 26.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Amazing. At this eclipse, the temperature after third contact would never have time to recover and get back to the temperatures at first contact because the sun was setting and would be below the horizon before fourth contact. If changes in temperature during an eclipse interest you, there's another experiment you can do. Record temperature data a few inches above the ground and at chest level, and if possible, suspend the temperature data logger above the ground 10 to 15 feet. Be sure to keep all of them shaded from direct sunlight. Due to the way the ground absorbs energy and creates heating, each temperature curve should be slightly different from each other. I hope to do this experiment at a future eclipse. Thank you for watching this Solar Eclipse Timer episode. I suggest you make some attempt to log temperature data at your next eclipse. I hope I have given you some information on how to do it properly. My goal is to make this YouTube channel the absolute best place for people to prepare for upcoming eclipses. So download my app and plan to get to the path of the next solar eclipse. It's a wonderful thing to witness. Please help me teach people how to enjoy a solar eclipse. You can do this by subscribing, hitting the bell, and most importantly, tell a friend about this channel. Post comments and questions. Thanks again. I appreciate your time.